Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to this week's, uh, this month's rather, Friday Twilight Session. My name's Dane, I'm part of the educational staff and one of the natural science volunteers here, as well as a natural history writer and STEM ambassador outside the museum. And uh, tonight I'm going to be taking you through uh, an important part of our natural history in conjunction with the new temporary exhibition, Carboniferous Monsters. Regarding this high oxygen level body size thing, there's a bit of misinformation that I see going around quite a bit on social media, which is the idea that high oxygen levels generally are the reason we have giant prehistoric animals. That's not true. Dinosaurs, mammoths, megalodon, all these other giant charismatic prehistoric animals, they got big on their own terms. The high oxygen levels has nothing to do with it, it's just the bugs. One of the big factors, and this applies to the arthropods as well, is ecological opportunities. The arthropods were the first animals to crawl out of the ocean and start populating the land, which basically meant there was no competition. They had all the opportunities in the world to spread out and diversify and take advantage of the new habitat. There is a concept in paleontology called ghost lineages, which is where we have a fossil animal, or we might have a group of closely related fossil animals, but we don't have the things that they evolved from. We haven't yet found the fossils of their direct ancestors, which can make it a little bit difficult to figure out exactly where they fit on the family tree. Usually we have a broad idea, we know it's a reptile or a bird or a mammal, but the specifics are a bit tricky to figure out. With the Tully monster, not a clue. There's nothing else in the fossil record or alive today like this. It's got little circular gills like a lamprey, it's got eyes on stalks like a snail, it's got this mouth on a stick thing going on, which some insects have, but nothing quite like this. Lampreys, sharks, stingrays, sturgeons, coelacanths, lungfish, uh, seahorses, carp, catfish, eels, all of these animals are separated in their evolutionary histories by hundreds of millions of years. A seahorse has less in common with a shark than a human does with a frog. And there's an increasing number of people in the scientific community today, and I count myself as one of these, who think that fish as a term is paraphyletic. It's not one true group of closely related animals. It's a bunch of very distantly related animals that we've grouped together out of convenience, frankly. Some of them, though, seem to have gone through a bit of an unusual uh, radiation. This was explained to me by Dr. Steve Walsh from the National Museum of Scotland. Some of these early tetrapods have these very long serpentine bodies with tiny, tiny little legs, legs that are far too small to support them on land. But they are proper legs. So what seems to have happened is that these tetrapods have come out onto the land, they've started adapting to the terrestrial lifestyle, they've spent enough time there to develop proper arms and legs and hands and knees and shoulders, and then some of them have gone, now I'm going back in, and they've reverted back to a secondarily aquatic lifestyle. Lots of animals do this, crocodiles, whales, sea turtles, basically any animal that has come up onto the land and then returned to the water. So when a fossil is preserved well enough, you can take slices of it, place it under a microscope and look at the internal microstructure, particularly in terms of growth. And the conclusion they came to was that the body of a Daphosaurus grew quite slowly, but the sail grew very, very quickly as the animal reached maturity. This is what we expect from social display structures. If you think about the horns of antelope or cattle or the decorative feathers of various bird species, young animals don't have them because they're not competing for territory, they're not trying to win mates or anything like that. But as soon as they're old enough, they grow in really, really quickly. So a Daphosaurus was probably a really spectacular looking animal, particularly during the breeding season. The sail might have been brightly coloured with really striking patterns. They may have shown off to one another with other dances. Far from being these really ancient, sluggish, primitive animals, they were really dynamic and flamboyant. So when these plants died, they just kind of piled up, particularly in waterlogged environments, in the swamps and the rivers, they would just fall down on each other and pile up and pile up and soak and fester. And eventually, they turn into peat, which is this uh, very dense, very carbon-rich uh, organic mulch. Uh, historically, it's been used as a kind of biofuel or a kind of fertilizer, although those kinds of practices are gradually being outlawed these days because we now understand that peat is an incredibly important carbon sink. Now, if you look at the distribution here on this map, the, the gray spots are the carboniferous deposits and the little red spots are kind of towns and cities and settlements that sprung up as a result of these coal mining communities being brought together. And there's a general pattern that is this sort of southwest to northeast cut of it. And that actually aligns with something else that you might not think of initially when you think of geology. 
It's the North-South divide. There's this cultural phenomenon, this perception of the uh, working class North versus the more affluent, business-oriented South. Why do we need to know about this stuff? It happened millions of years ago. It doesn't affect us. It's not important. But it is. It gives us context. It gives us context for how we got to where we are today, not just uh, biologically as a land-walking, uh, air-breathing vertebrate, but culturally, it's the, the landscape of our society has been determined by the geology and the nature of the deep past. It shows we're not separate from it. Events that happened hundreds of millions of years ago continue to influence our lives today. And in kind, events that happen today will almost certainly have an influence for hundreds of millions of years to come. Thank you very much.